what I'd like to do is take you to one of the oldest books in the Bible and see how he processed it because there's a lot more in here than comes to our mind immediately once you start reading this. I mean, it's a densely textured book. There are so many questions that arise even right from the introduction. What is God really saying here? What is happening behind the scenes? But we know the basic drama of this. Job has lost all of his possessions. He's lost his family. And finally, he has lost his own physical well-being. He is covered from head to toe with sores and he is about to talk to God and his wife comes and gives him some advice in chapter 2 and verse 9. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this Job did not sin in what he said. At this point, he's literally holding on to the slender thread of a totally sovereign God. But what he is agonized with is his theological assumptions. Be good and be blessed. Be bad and be cursed. Be good and be blessed. Be bad and be cursed. He says, all right, God is sovereign. I've received all of this. What I want to know is, why am I receiving it? If I have done wrong, explain it. To me please David Hume put it in these words were a stranger to suddenly drop into this world I would show him as a specimen of its ills a hospital full of diseases a prison crowded with malefactors and debtors a field strewn with carcasses a fleet floundering in the ocean a nation languishing under tyranny famine or pestilence honestly I don't see how you can possibly square with an ultimate purpose of love. That last line is almost a metaphysical giveaway. I'm not quite sure if Hume really had thought through that very statement because even love needs an ontic referent. It needs some objective definition. And in the naturalistic framework, how do you even assume that love can have a point of reference objectively? But so goes Hume. And he says, I would show a stranger all that's around us. How can there be ultimately a purpose of love? I think it was Camus who said this. It is not science that has led me to doubt the purpose of God. It is the state of this world. It is this pitiless, unending struggle for existence among the nations. It is the collapse of our idealisms before the brute facts of force and chaos. It is the feeling that there is something demonic in the heart of things which is working against us. That there is a radical twist in the very constitution of the universe which will ultimately defer, defeat man's hopes, make havoc of his dreams, and bring his pathetic optimism crashing in disaster purpose look at the world that settles it so what are the two notions they have introduced in their last line for Hume it is love for Camus as an existential thinker he's looking for purpose meaning and that's really what it is all about trying to make sense out of it all one philosopher puts it as a trilemma for Christians and considers it an evidential argument against the existence of God not just an a question to defend theism but he said the reality of evil provides evidence against the existence of God how so with the trilemma Christians say God is all-powerful Christians say God is all-loving and yet sin exists that's the trilemma an all-powerful God an all-loving God the reality of evil and of course my immediate response when I read that uh, I think it is Mackie who pr produces that I say to him, to him why have you just taken three assumptions of the Christian faith why is it not a quadlemma why is it not a quintilemma a quadlemma could say God is also all wise does not the wisdom of God bring in a completely different component to the paradigmatic problem and God, the fifth one, God lives in eternity. Does not time play a factor here in understanding pain and suffering? If you take a child, 
It's about a year old and you take that child to the doctor and he's about to get jabbed with big needles. My mother is all loving. My mother has the power to either take me into this building or take me out of this building. <laughs> Why on earth has she taken me into the building where this man is going to jab and hurt me? It takes a few years for the child to find out, ah, now I know. I came, I've come here from Ottawa, Canada, where I spoke at the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast, and a fantastic gathering. 50 years it's been going. And the night before, at the di dinner, Dr. Kent Brantley spoke. Some of you may know his name. The doctor who contracted Ebola when he was in Africa. It has been seldom that I've heard such a riveting testimony of the power of God in the life of a totally committed man who understood his calling. He's a physician, and there in just somber tones, yet plain speaking language, told of the horror that struck his body. And as he described it, and all that had to be done to him to put him in, in, in the same, to that protective suit and fly him out from there and bring him to Emory, and all that went on to ultimately rid him of that dreaded disease would have taken, that would have taken his life. What if he were a child and you had to explain all that you were doing to that child? Time becomes a component. Understanding becomes a component. To say there's a trilemma is actually trivializing the problem. It is much more complex than just three propositions from the Christian faith. But here it is. Job struggles. And he begins to complain. And the biggest problem he had right at the beginning was his friends. I would never dream of giving my son the name Eliphaz, Bildad, or Zophar. <laughs> they simply don't look good. And the best thing they did was when they sat silent for a few days, just sitting by his bed. The problem began when they opened their mouths. There's a lot going on here. And that's why he even comments on what kind of miserable comforters are you? You boys are supposed to be my friends. Friends should at least try to defang the pain in some way. So the first one, Eliphaz, the oldest, begins with an incredible story. I don't know which church he went to. But he begins by this. He says... A spirit glided past my face. The hair of my face stood up. As soon as he would have begun like that, if I was sitting on an ash pile, I'd say, please, Lord, help me. Where is this boy going? He first, a spirit glided past my face. The hair of my face stood up, and it stood still. But I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. And then I heard a voice. Can mortal man be righteous before God? Can a man be pure before his maker. All right, here's Job, you're, you're sitting head to toe with boils, and I come to you and say, I want to tell you something. A spirit glided past my face. The hair on my body just stood up, you know. There was silence, and he probably was saying, I wish you'd do the same. And then, <clears throat> then the spirit spoke, can a man be pure before his maker? Can a man be righteous before God? Even if it were true, there's a problem here. I remember uh, my professor of uh, the history of Christian thought in my graduate school days. Some of you may, may know the name, but he had seven earned degrees. Three of them were doctorates, uh, Dr. Montgomery. We used to pray before we went to class because he used to give half of the grade for the questions we asked in class. And we'd think up half, sit up half the night thinking up of questions. And uh, then he gave us the exam, and I had a problem. I didn't understand a single of his question. And I kept looking at this saying, what am I going to do? I don't even know what he's asking me for. But the bothersome thing was the guy in the next desk was writing away furiously, hardly breathing between sentences and going on and on and on and on. I said, what's the matter? He's writing, taking more sheets, ripping more sheets, filling out. I've yet to comprehend what he's asking me to write about. So on the day when we got our marks back, I wanted to see what he got. And when Dr. Montgomery handed it back, he looked at his sheet of paper. You know, in, in India, when we grew up and we didn't know the answer to something, 
we'd write as much as we think was possibly remotely connected to the subject, <laughs> and in the volume of words would be some hint in the direction. We used to call it padding, padding, just pad, you know, just say all that you think needs to be said, and somewhere you may say what the professor wants to see. Well, he padded it, and Dr. Montgomery, just in red ink, wrote this one line. This is not right. This is not even wrong. <laughs> you see, if you say something is right, you're assuming something's been said. If you say something is wrong, again you're assuming something's been said. When it does not even rise to the dignity of an error, that's when you say this is not even wrong. What do you say to a man like Eliphaz? So Job just comes back and he says this, you know what? A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends. Please don't leave me to suffer like this. And then he says, your speeches are heartless. You would even cost, cost lots upon orphans. All right, if I have sinned, tell me why I'm not being pardoned. I won't argue against it. Why am I being punished? Then he comes out with this line, teach me and I will hold my peace. Lead me to understand. So he's, Eliphaz is done with his speech. And then comes Bildad, he's a little more cruel. He calls Job a windbag. And then he says, inquire I pray thee of the former age and apply myself to that which the fathers have searched out. They shall utter words out of the past. Again, it's good counsel, but it's simply not getting to where Job's at. Inquire of the past. Augustine has written on these issues. Luther has written on these issues. So many great thinkers have written on these issues. Inquire of them what it is they really said. Yes, it helps. One of my professors <clears throat> at Trinity was a man by the name of Feinberg, Dr. Feinberg. His master's thesis, his doctoral dissertation was on the problem of evil and the problem of pain. I quoted him in my book. I had no idea what he, following all of that, went through with his family as his wife contracted a most dreaded disease in which gradually you lose all capacity. And then to their horror they found, find out <clears throat> that it is passed on from generation to generation and he became terrified about what his children would face and Dr. Feinberg said with all of my reading and all of my knowledge and all of my breadth of understanding when this news came to me I was floored I didn't know where to go with it and that's the reality you understand that I understand that I've been through some of it myself and every time it happens I say, this is hard, Lord. I don't know how I'm going to climb this hill. You understand what's going on? I don't. And so, as Bildad says, inquire of the former age, Job's response is this. Look, is his power arbitrary? Does he really, at whim, inflict this stuff? He says, I don't God, doubt God's existence. I'm just wondering about his purpose. And then he says, how can I be just before God? He says, why doesn't he just leave me alone? Not bother with me. Why this? And then he comes out with this. Is there an umpire between God and me? Somebody who can plead my cause before him. And so Eliphaz's speech ends with Job asking for understanding. Now he's coming a little more to a point, he says, I want to know if there's somebody who can stand before God on my behalf and plead my case. Now comes Zophar, the youngest, and he's the rudest. And he goes on to say, you know what, Job? We've really got a problem. It is easier for a, God, for a donkey that to learn wisdom than for us to teach you an idiot. How do we teach you? How are we going to get through to you? And then he says, don't you understand, Job? 
your ways are not God's ways, his ways are not yours. Again, it's true. We know that. God's ways are not our ways. Job is just trying to wrestle with purpose, trying to wrestle with representation, and now he comes to a series of questions and he says this, talk to me, God, what have I done? Is there a clue? And then he comes with this statement to his friends, when you boys die, wisdom is gonna die with you. You see what's happened? Those who came to help have suddenly become his tormentors because they are missing something very important. I've learned in years of visiting places where an awful lot of pain is being experienced. You're better off remaining silent and just shedding your tears with that individual than saying something that is going to just hurt even more. <clears throat> In the book, I give this illustration. I've had two major back surgeries. If any one of you has lived with major back issues, you know the kind of pain you can have. And for, there were days where even after my surgery, I'd be sitting in my car, gonna meet my wife or children for dinner, and I'd be sitting there in a parking spot and lean on the steering wheel and just cry. The pain was so agonizing. I have two titanium rods from L3 to S1, four clamps, eight screws bolting me down. I injured it very badly many, many years ago, and all those years went by with a lot of pain. And as I have struggled with that, I've just found out that sometimes all you really need is a helping arm around your shoulder or something during those days. Here's what I want to tell you. I tell this story in my book. After my back surgery, you know, it's a heavy padding they put on there, and um, I, I couldn't move. For about four days, I couldn't move. Actually, that was the second one, because the dura, the lining tore, and uh, trying to mend that was a challenge, and he said, for four days, you can't move. You have to lie totally motionless. He says, if you need to turn, we'll send a couple of nurses, and they will try to turn you. Together. So I went and uh, lay down, and about two days go by, and I say, I wish I could just lie on my back for a minute or two, you know. So I called uh, an orderly. He brought another man, and they very skillfully, with a sheet under them, they turned me to my side, all for about two, three minutes, and then I had to come back. Middle of the night, I said, I just have to turn. So I called the nurse. And she said, all right, I'll try and turn you. I said, ma'am, it took two pretty tough guys to do it in the afternoon. Can you bring another nurse to help you? You're gonna need two. I don't think you can do it all by yourself. She said, no, 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 I'm very experienced. I said, the way they did it, it needed two of them to hold a sheet, <laughs> you know. She said, you know what? I've been a nurse long enough, so I wasn't gonna argue. She rammed her hands underneath my back I will not tell you the thoughts in my mind, but I will tell you that I screamed. And you know what she said? You've had back surgery. I thought you'd come for a hip replacement. I couldn't believe this. The next day when I told the doctor that, I won't tell you what he said. He stormed out of that room because that place could not be touched. You touch a healing wound in a wrong way, you will do greater damage than any intent you may have had in your heart. And I've come to this conclusion. Be wise in what you say, when you say it. So, Job comes directly to God. And out of the silence, God answers him. And God asks him 64 questions back to back, which was the last thing Job wanted. He wanted answers. And God, God says, all right, I'll talk to you now like a man. Where were you when the foundations of the earth were laid? Were you there when all of the boundaries were set? And on and on and on, a series of questions on the intricacy and the fine-tuning 
and the majesty of this world, something like the psalmist said, you know, when I look at the world, the heavens and the work of your hands, the, the moon and the stars which you have made, what is there in man that you shall keep him, that you keep him in mind? The whole fascinating world around us. Job, do you really understand all of that? Since you're telling me you will only accept that which you can totally comprehend, let me give you a little test right from the beginning. Tell me how you comprehend this world around you. Do you understand the intricacies of all this? God is opening him up within his own assumptions. When you question a questioner, you determine the entry point of the discussion and you open up the questioner within their own assumptions. That's exactly what God's doing here. Do you really only take all of that which you truly understand? <clears throat> you know, this whole revelation is for God to reveal to Job that he is the creator and the designer. He is the creator and the designer. Now I understand that in our sophistication with a scientific single vision that we want to give to this world, those are two concepts that are not very popular in the scientific world. Even scientists like uh, Vikramasinghe and Hoyle, when they wrote their book Evolution from Space, what did they say? Vikrama Singha from Sri Lanka is a Buddhist, which is a non-theistic religion. Sir Frederick Hoyle was a skeptic, an astronomer. Brilliant minds, brilliant minds. <clears throat> they go on to say, the mathematical impossibility of just the protein formation is so astronomical that Hoyle says it boils down, and Vikrama Singha, a mathematician, says it is so preposterous given the time to think that all this can come together in just in the protein formation, that he would consider it impossible to explain evolution in an earth-bound theory. He's not dispensing with evolution. That's what he's saying. He said in an earth-bound theory, there has to be something transcendent from here. That's when they he posited the panspermian theory that spores from another planet were brought to seed the earth. Hoyle didn't want to buy that at that time, but Hoyle also accepted it. Francis Crick has accepted it, that spores from another planet. This is the Nobel laureate. He says, maybe in a spaceship or whatever. I, won't even, I, won't, I don't even want to go in that direction. I just want to say to you, we make a mistake when we misposition the idea of evolution as if evolution is pitting itself against creation. It may, it may, and it may not. Evolution to me is a theory of processes. I'm now talking about beginnings. Beginnings. My professor of quantum, John Pokinghorn, at Cambridge University, the, 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 the dean of... Uh, Queen's College, Cambridge. Pokinghorn's a late comer to Christ. In his book, One World, he talks about all the precision required and the contingencies for the early picoseconds of the universe. Here's what he says with just one of them. He said, if you take the expansion and contraction rate, this is one of the issues that, Haw that Hawking wrestles with too. But if you take the early picoseconds of the expansion and contraction rate of the universe, he says the exactitude demanded was so perfect and the margin of error so small that one slight number off and the universe would have collapsed he said the exactitude demanded would be like taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe 20 billion light years away and hitting it bullseye the RZIM Church Leaders Conference is going to address the most timely challenges Christianity is facing. You can attend here in person, or you can register to watch by live stream on RZIM 
www.thepodcastnetwork.org. We have an incredible lineup of speakers, including Ravi Zacharias, Louis Giglio, John Lennox, Crawford Loritz, Michael Ramsden, Abdu Murray, Sam Alberry, and Joe Vitale. So please join us from October 3rd to the 5th. I hope to see you soon. People are interested in having a spiritual life, but treat faith more like an a la carte menu at a restaurant, choosing what they like and dismissing the rest. Cutting through the hype and seduction is the clear voice of author and apologist Ravi Zacharias in his book, Why Jesus? Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass-Marketed Spirituality. Ravi answers the attraction known as the New Spirituality. Billy Graham calls Why Jesus a powerful defense of how Jesus Christ brings meaning and hope to an individual life. And Charles Swindoll says, I'm not acquainted with a brighter mind or a more relevant and devoted defender of the faith than Ravi Zacharias. Why Jesus is available in bookstores now or online at rzim.org. The purpose of RZIM is to engage meaningfully with the questions and heartfelt issues of our culture. We do that in areas of business, academia, politics, the arts, and media. We live in an age of confusion, and people from every continent are beginning to wonder whether there are any answers to life's biggest questions. And RZIM consists of over 50 speakers and adjuncts operating in over 20 countries, working at every level to reach those who shape the culture of a country and its future direction with the gospel. In addition to taking the gospel to various arenas of influence, we are also committed to providing a variety of training events in order to meet people where those who came around him to love him, two categories, designing engineers and loving friends, those two categories really ought to be jettisoned in a naturalistic framework within which Hawking wants to explain all of everything. Love is a metaphysical notion. It doesn't come to us from physics or chemistry. It's the great reality that you and I long for, need, hunger for. I watched it and as a youngster growing up and my need for it and the lack of it led me to a bed of suicide when I was 17. I watched it in our children growing up. Now I'm watching it with four grandchildren and watching the affection and the longing and the love that they long for and experience. It is not explainable with physical quantities it is a transcendent notion of our greatest need. So when we talk about a creator designer, we immediately bring in, bring in the fact that there's a designed purpose for love. And even the fact that Job is looking for logic and answers is the way we've been hardwired by God to think things through. Creator, designer. Secondly, he comes to him <clears throat> as a revealer and comforter, revealer and comforter. When he comes to him as revealer comforter, he, God, he, God says to him, he says, you know, uh, he says that uh, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear. Now I have seen you, I abhor myself and I'm horrified. What I say to you is this, the Judeo-Christian worldview is the only worldview where the experience of the living God and His grace is given to us in a personal relationship to which He calls us. I hope you heard what I said because the answers are sometimes beyond propositional. The answers come in a relationship and that relationship is what the Redeemer offers to you and to me in that indwelling presence. We don't hear much about it these days because it's not very popular. <clears throat> I was speaking at a, one of the, our Ivy League schools and one man had written quite a, one student had written quite a hostile article and one of his criticisms was anecdotal arguments. So I took note of that and I smiled. 
And uh, I picked him out in the audience because I said somebody wrote an article about some of the arguments being very anecdotal and the girl sitting next to him went this way, so I got on, you know. <clears throat> so I went on. I said, if I ask you why you don't believe in God, one of your answers may be, you've seen so much of suffering, and I'll say, what do you mean? You'll say, you know, my uncle's brother's friend's son somewhere, and you'll tell me some story of somebody you saw suffering very much. Will you resort to an anecdotal argument or stay purely in the logic of it? I said, I'll ask you this. When you remove an anecdotal argument, do you know what you're actually doing? You're doing away with almost all of Hinduism. The Mahabharata, the Gita, it's all anecdotal. You're doing away with all of Sunni Islam. It's all anecdotal. I said, let's not live in this cerebral ivory tower where we think an argument is purely uh, the, you, you've got uh, to posit uh, the, the, a major premise, a minor premise, validity and deduction. I said, that is valid, I understand. But so much of life is lived out at the existential level and at the relational level. And we must bridge the two between argument and experience and in the Christian worldview the experience is so real but the argument goes beyond that and let me illustrate this for you it's fascinating to me Peter gets up to the mountain and to him is given an experience of the of the transfiguration of the Lord it is an amazing thing to be witnessing vouchsafed to three disciples Peter James and John so overwhelming is that as the body of Christ glows with the whitest whiteness that you can imagine that he's blinded and he falls on his face and after it is over he looks at he, he looks at Jesus and says let's stay here let's not go down he wants to live in the immediate afterglow permanently of what he just experienced this is the same Peter who writes and says we were eye witnesses to his majesty but now we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay heed to it as light in a dark place. Ladies and gentlemen, Christ brings in your life both the argument and the experience. <clears throat> sometimes, some, sometimes I hear something like this, you know, people Dawkins' argument, you were born in India, you know, you'd be a Hindu if you're born here in such a place. I don't know where he comes up with his statistics, but it's unbelievable, you know. The fastest growing church in the world today is in China, not exactly a bedrock of Christendom. You know. but it's the fastest growing church in the world there. When I came to Jesus Christ, I was a 17-year-old, misguided, hopeless, lost individual lost and a man brought a Bible into my hospital room I had never opened a Bible on my own in my life it's a long story I've told it in my book walking from east to west so those of you read it understand it but here it is as that verse is being read to me and I trust in Christ I was 17 years old then, I turned 69 last month. 52 years later, the vibrancy of that relationship only throbs harder and harder and harder in my life. It's so real. I was telling the folks in Ottawa, my sister who's married to a pastor now in Toronto, Canada, my sister and all knew who I was, what I lived like, we grew up together. And she'd just gone somewhere in the world where somebody had said their lives had been changed by some comments I'd made, books written, I don't know, forget where it was. And she said, Ravi, I just want to tell you something. I know Dad was ruthless with you. And I know he used to try to hurt you by saying, you're going to end up in jail one day. I just want you to know what dad didn't see, your heavenly father did. And so I ask you, have you truly come to that point of getting on your knees 
and making that commitment which will so transform your life and give you new hungers and new hopes. Paul, writing in 2 Corinthians 12, he says, you know what? I had an experience 14 years ago. I'd love to tell you about it. But it isn't the body or out of the body, I couldn't tell. This man was lifted up into paradise. I'd love to talk about it, but I won't. All I want to talk about is I had some thorns in the flesh that I wished would go away. And I now know that he's made his strength perfect in my weakness and his grace is sufficient for me. That's the word, grace. And so Annie Johnston Flint, born as a little girl, Orphaned, raised by the Bon Annie Johnston, lay raised by the Flint family, early in life contracted rheumatoid arthritis, then cancer, then blindness, then incontinence. She lay in bed with eight pillows cushioning her body, covered from head to toe with boils. One of the greatest hymn writers ever. She writes, He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, He addeth His mercy. To multiplied trials has multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit, His grace has no measure, His power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of His infinite riches in Jesus, He giveth and giveth and giveth again. I'd heard of you by the hearing of my ear. Now I've seen you, I abhor myself, I'm horrified. Creator, designer, revealer, comforter. Thirdly, he comes as mediator, savior. I know that my redeemer lives and I shall see him in my flesh. At the heart of the gospel is a story of suffering. The captain of our salvation was made complete through suffering. See, sin is brokenness. It's brokenness. It shatters purpose. It's a violation of purpose. So Pilate gets into the cockpit, 140 some innocent passengers sitting in the back. None of them knew this man was going to violate the purpose for which that commercial flight was designed. Sin is a violation of purpose. And when we violated the purpose and the solidarity of it, brokenness came and we share in that brokenness. And the only way back was through this suffering savior who showed us what evil really does and conquered the grave to offer forgiveness for you and for me. The greatest victory in life is not often the healing of the body, it is the healing of the soul. It's a story I was telling my colleague and one or two others in the last week. I was involved in a conversation to a person where there was a lot of pain and he was making some choices. And when I went to see this individual, I had no hope, but I just prayed prayed very hard, got on my knees, and I drove that 45, 50 miles to see, and sat down in the car and chatted. I said, I just want to talk to you. The choice that is being made is not a good choice, and I'll tell you why. And we chatted. When I drove away from there, there were tears running down my face, because I'd seen a miracle. I'd seen a miracle from a heart determined to go in one direction. The heart turned in another direction. I didn't do it. I can't do it. God can. God does. The Savior that he gives to you and me, as somebody in Cambodia said to me, we don't need more politicians here now. He said, we need a Savior somebody who can rescue us. My next engagement at the end of this week begins in Armenia. 
in Yerevan, where they are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the genocide of the Armenian Christians. That wound is still fresh 100 years later. But I have, we have in our colleagues, team, those from there who are with the nation that victimized them and there is no ill will, just a healing bond of healing. Some of you may have heard my, my colleague Nabil Qureshi. Nabil is from Pakistan, I'm from India. Enough said. <laughs> and yet, here we are, as close bond brothers in the faith because we have a common Savior and a common Heavenly Father. I just want you to know, the Savior that God gives to you and me provides a transformation of heart, because I'll tell you why. The worst effect of sin is manifested not in pain or suffering or bodily defacement, but in the discrowned faculties, the unworthy loves, the low ideals, the brutalized and the enslaved spirit. The worst effect of sin is manifested not in pain or suffering or bodily defacement, but in the discrowned faculties, the unworthy loves, the low ideals, and the brutalized and enslaved spirit. That's why the worst kind of crimes are not committed sometimes by the neediest, but the most sophisticated. I know that my Redeemer lives, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this story. And I just say to you that if Christ be not raised from the dead, we are of all people most miserable. But if Jesus indeed rose again from the dead and rises, offering us to be our Savior now, but the judge in the end, so the man who takes out a sword and lops off the head of another human, human being in some grandiose expression of power and brutality, man has a judge waiting for him. Man has a judge waiting for him because he has violated the image of God in murdering a human being. That's what Genesis 9, 6 says. Justice and the balances will be set straight. Hope and forgiveness is offered in our Savior if we would come to Him. So He comes as Creator, Designer, Revealer, Comforter, Mediator, Savior, and lastly, as Strengthener and Restorer. Strengthener and Restorer. Job received all the strength back that he needed. All the healing of his wounds and he looks at his friends and offers to pray for them. You know, it's a remarkable story at the end when God gives you back your strength and God restores you. That's why the Bible says, I has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So creator, designer, revealer, comforter, mediator, savior, strengthener, restorer. Job finds that connection back. I want to make three or four applications and then close. Application number one. If, if meaninglessness came from being weary of pain, I would understand the problem as being singularly unique, but it's not so. G.K. Chesterton said, meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness ultimately comes from being weary of pleasure. It is ironic to me, I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Oscar Wilde and Jesus and Pascal. Pascal and Wilde had their funerals in the same church, so I brought the two personalities in. But Oscar Wilde's grave in Paris, a huge, huge phoenix, and the verse of scripture that he chose to put on his stone, was a verse from Job. 
I don't know all the ramifications, I don't have all the answers, I don't have all the explanations for him, but I want to just say this, as a hedonist, he looked to Job to describe his life in the end. Meaninglessness, if you're living a sensually driven life right now, I can tell you, you're moving towards total emptiness. Meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure, which means purpose and meaning have to be defined transcendingly over the two poles of pleasure and pain. Secondly, it is this. When belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from Him. But in heaven's name, to what? What? That was Chesterton's question. Do you have a worldview that gives you an answer? May I suggest to you as a naturalist, not only will you not find an answer, I'm not even sure you can justify the question. Because if suffering is evil, then you must assume good. If you assume good, you must assume a moral law. If you assume a moral law, you must posit a moral law giver. But that's whom you're trying to disprove and not prove. If there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. The question evaporates. Now you say, wait a minute, that was too fast. <laughs> you say, why do I need a moral law giver? I'll tell you why. Because the question of evil and suffering is always raised by people or about people, which means the question assumes people have intrinsic worth. That's an assumption you cannot make in a naturalistic framework. You need a transcendent creator, essential worth, in order to talk about essential worth for you and me. Otherwise, we are the random product of time plus matter plus chance. I think we have to think about that. Number three, and it is this, and my fourth one will be very brief here. There's a little gal, there's a young gal in Georgia by the name of Ashlyn Blocker. She's born with a disease called SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. Very rare disease in this world where the person doesn't feel pain. But there's a problem. They could step on a nail and not know it. They could put a hand on a burning stove and not know it. And so she has to be watched, even when she is involved in sports, anytime. And the mother in an interview said to the interviewer, my prayer every night is, dear God, please let my daughter begin to feel pain. If in this finite world, pain is an indicator to us that something is wrong, is it impossible in the mind of an infinite God, to have pain as a reminder to us that we must turn to Him, both for grace of forgiveness and grace of sustenance. Pain can be a blessing and an indicator. And the last thing I say to you is, in the greatest chapter that the Apostle Paul wrote, I think, 1 Corinthians 13, if you go to Corinth today outside the church, it's on marble. Way up there is where the brothels used to be. But his sermon on love, and he ends with that incredible statement of the three great supremacies of life. In the end, there abides faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The three supremacies of life, faith, hope, and love, none of those are possible, is possible, without pain. Faith will always be tested. Hope will always be daunted. Love will always stagger with other issues. But they are the great supremacies of life. So when I was writing my book, I was writing it in Jakarta, and I had lunch with a Chinese pastor of one of the largest churches in the country, Stephen Tong. He and I sat at his table with a very meager lunch. He said to me, 
What are you writing about? I said, pain. He said, Dr. Ravi, I'm older than you. Let me tell you something. Pain is necessary in life. And we continued eating. <laughs> I said, tell me about your life. When he started to unfold his story, he knew what pain was. And I walked away from there and told a friend, I've just seen an illustration of how to triumph through trials and be ministering to people all over the world with the voice of a veteran and the heart of a pastor evangelist. Ladies and gentlemen, those who have wisdom the best are those who have faced much and still endured with their faith unshaken in God. God bless you. Thank you so much. People are interested in having a spiritual life, but treat faith more like an a la carte menu at a restaurant, choosing what they like and dismissing the rest. Cutting through the hype and seduction is the clear voice of author and apologist Ravi Zacharias in his book, Why Jesus? Rediscovering His Truth in a